So hi everyone, um, welcome to the 16th session of our Med AI group exchange sessions. Um, this week we have Shantanu from uh, DeepMind here with us to talk about his research on bootstrapped self-supervision um, representation learning in graphs. Um, Shantanu is currently a research engineer at DeepMind and his primary research interests include graph representation learning and reinforcement learning, especially when applied to large scale applications. Um, he also received his master's from Stanford University, where he was working on AI safety and neural network verifications. So thanks so much again, Shantanu, for joining us today. And um, just before we start, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Would you prefer us um, interrupting you or keep it all till the end? Yeah, the, the more interruptions, the better. So please uh, ask anything uh, at any time. <laughs> Awesome. OK, so let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Um, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Shantanu for his talk. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Nandita and C for organizing this. Um, yeah, I hope uh, my screen is visible. Uh, yeah, so I'm very excited to be here. And hopefully we have some nice discussions uh, yeah, and a nice interactive session. Uh, so the work I'm presenting today is a bootstrap representation learning on graphs which was work done with uh, all of the great people listed here. So just as a quick um, agenda, I guess, for the talk, uh, we'll start with a super quick recap of the absolute basics of graphs, uh, then talk a bit more about graph uh, representation learning uh, specifically, uh, and some drawbacks with some of the current methods uh, that are used. Then we'll talk about uh, BGRL, which is our proposed uh, method, which tries to address some of these drawbacks. Uh, and then just some experiments and some of the standard benchmarks. Uh, and more recently, we were uh, scaling this up to the OGB large scale challenge, which many of you might have heard of because it was being organized by Stanford uh, researchers. Uh, and some of the practical considerations that come uh, when trying to scale up these uh, methods to much larger uh, real world data sets. Uh, and again, please, uh, any questions at any time, uh, feel free to stop me. Cool. So. Let's just uh, start with the basics, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So uh, we're interested in uh, data with some special structure. So the nodes are usually the entities that um, we're most interested in. The edges are connections between the different nodes. And a graph is just a collection of nodes and their associated edges. And uh, a graph can have uh, features or attributes at each of these different levels. So at node level, edge level, or graph level. And the data set uh, is just comprising of one or more uh, disjoint graphs. So these are just some kind of cartoony depictions of graphs. Um, but they're, they're also very um, practically useful. And a lot of real world problems can be modeled as graphs. So for example, at DeepMind and Google, there was a lot of work on modeling transportation networks, uh, particularly from Google Maps uh, as graphs, where you can think of nodes as intersections on the map and edges as just the roads between intersections. Um, and a lot of features kind of naturally pop out from this, like maybe the expected time it takes to travel across the road, length of road, stuff like that. You know, and one of the tasks that um, uh, they were interested in was ETA prediction, uh, which graph neuro modeling this as a graph actually helped a lot with. Uh, and what might be more interesting to this audience is maybe representing even molecules as graphs. So you could have like the atoms as the different nodes, a bond between atoms as the edges, uh, and again, very natural features uh, that arise from say some chemical properties uh, can be associated with this data. Uh, and maybe a possible task could be to predict whether the molecule has certain uh, desirable biological properties, maybe for use in something like drug discovery. Okay, so basically, yeah, in a nutshell, that's the kind of data we're interested in. And for this graph data, we're trying to find uh, interesting representations, right? But how are we trying to compute those representations? So uh, we want to use graph neural networks, which are basically a special kind of model, which of course we want to use the graph data. So we want to use the node features and the edge features, and also use uh, really take advantage of the connections between the nodes. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we want to be we want to not be sensitive in the to the order in which these nodes or the neighbors of each node are processed. So for example, uh, I think there are some methods where um, say to output the representation of a node, we feed all their 
the neighbors of the node to an LSTM, right? And then uh, at the end, whatever the LSTM outputs is the representation of the node. Uh, and that's uh, th that works fine sometimes, but um, of course it's very sensitive to the order in which we process things. So for this work, at least we're trying to restrict ourselves to the class of models, which um, respect these equivariances and invariances. So um, with that in mind, we're gonna be considering three very uh, general or well-represented uh, flavors of GNN layers, uh, starting with convolutional layers. Uh, these are kind of very simple, where each node <laughs> Uh, computes its representation by aggregating together um, features from all of its neighbors with some fixed coefficients. And these are the simplest, but also the easiest to train. Uh, and they're also quite useful uh, in many um, types of data sets. Uh, next, we have attentional um, neural networks, which are slight, uh, slight generalization, where each node can choose to pay more attention to some of its neighbors than others. So here, let's say node B might be paying more attention to node A and C than to D and E. Uh, and this is uh, computed based on say similarity of the different nodes. Uh, and this is definitely more expressive, but it's also sometimes harder to train. And on the complete right end of the spectrum, we have message passing neural networks, which are much more powerful in general. So here each edge computes a message that the sender wants to send to its receiver and the receiver uh, aggregates together all the messages it receives, say through the sum or mean or something. Uh, but the computation of this message can be arbitrarily complex. So it could be a neural network that uh, takes as input, the features of the sender and the receiver, maybe concatenates them and does something very complex. Um, so these are definitely the most powerful, but in practice, they're very hard to train stably and to scale up. Uh, and one interesting thing is that most of the work in uh, self-supervised representational learning for graphs thus far was focusing only on convolutional um, uh, networks. And uh, it was found that they are pretty difficult to um, scale those same methods with attentional uh, networks, for example. So one kind of um, objective we had in mind was also, see, also to see if better methods can be more easily applied to more and more complex models. Okay, but yeah, the, uh, as a common theme, the output of a node is a simple function of itself and all of its neighbors. Okay, okay. So now we've defined what graphs are, so we know our inputs. We know where the GNN is, so we know uh, how to compute those inputs to get some uh, latent <coughs> uh, representations. And from this, uh, we can have different tasks. So let's say we learn node level latents. Uh, maybe you can stick a classifier on top of that and do node classification. Maybe we're learning representations at the graph level to do something like graph classification or even um, edge level um, latents to do something like link prediction, right? But um, in this talk, we're gonna be focused on this first part, uh, which is given a graph, how do we get um, very good latents which maybe then can be used for different downstream tasks. We're only gonna be focused on this uh, encoding part of it. Okay, so hopefully um, we're all on the same page so far. Uh, okay, so in graph representation learning specifically, uh, we're gonna restrict ourselves to node representations for now. So our goal is to learn meaningful representations without any form of supervision. And why is that? Uh, because especially for the graphs domain, unlabeled data is often cheaper and more easily available than labeled data. So for example, let's say for Google Maps, right? It's very hard to get accurate labels for every single point on the earth. Um, let's say for ETA prediction or something, um, but unlabeled data is much more uh, plentiful. Uh, and we can use this to pre-train models for a wide variety of downstream tasks. So. Uh, you know, just train some really good representations and maybe fine tune them later. Uh, and it can also be <coughs> a useful auxiliary signal to combine with uh, fully supervised, with supervised uh, loss for some semi-supervised training in case you do have say a small amount of labels. Um, so yeah, basically what would a good representation look like? Let's say we're given an input graph like this, where let's say the different colors are different classes of nodes. 
we want to uh, process this using an encoder, let's say a GCN, to get this low dimensional um, representation of the nodes, where you can see that you know, the nodes are approximately clustered by the class. Uh, and this is probably useful for a lot of downstream tasks. And of course, we want to compute this uh, low dimensional representation without actually taking uh, advantage of or uh, knowledge of what these colors actually are. Okay. Okay. So uh, some of the early um, methods. Shantanu, can I ask a quick question? Um, in, yeah. In, so um, is the expectation that these um, low level uh, embeddings should have the um, they should have some sort of edge connections also represented in them, like the closer they are in the latent space, you expect them to be closer in the actual graph. Um, like uh, very good question. Oh, very good question. I think the next slide is oh, okay. partially going to answer that. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, for, for a lot of uh, realistic tasks, I guess you would assume that um, nodes which are closer in the graph, if they have more similar properties, I think these are called like homophilus graphs where proximity in the graph implies similar uh, properties. Mm -hmm. Then you would want that. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, in general, that's a, a useful property to have. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, right, so I guess um, bouncing off of that question. Uh, yeah, so in the early methods, let's say we're asking ourselves, you know, what makes an embedding good? When we say we want a good representation, but we don't have access to labels. So what's our intuition in actually designing a method to get uh, these representations? Um, so one kind of intuitive answer could be, okay, we're interested in graphs specifically because they have you know, some interesting structure, right? The edges specifically. Um, and let's say as a first guess that good node representations are those which preserve this uh, structure in some sense. So, okay, so, so far we're saying, okay, representations should preserve structure. The simplest kind of unit of structure is just an edge, right, between nodes. So let's say if uh, the features of node i and node j are predictive of whether an edge exists between them, uh, maybe because their uh, representations are very close or because uh, of some other property, um, then we would say, okay, cool, like these node representations are encoding the graph structure. Uh, and then kind of taking a zoomed out view, instead of them actually uh, being connected in the original graph, let's say they co-occur in a short random walk. So basically they are uh, in some sense very close together in the original graph. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, if the features of uh, representations of i and j are predictive of uh, whether they're close together, maybe it's a good representation. And this is very similar to some NLP methods like word to vec and these methods uh, dominated unsupervised graph representation learning uh, before GNNs were very popular. Uh, so these are some of the methods um, which were very powerful. Oh, oops, yeah. Uh, but one of the uh, drawbacks of these is that they don't easily transfer to unknown or new graphs. So let's say you can't um, you know, train on one graph. Uh, you won't get a function that for an entirely new graph can compute representations. Uh, and they also don't uh, work well with GNN encoders in the sense that um, the inductive biases that these GNN architectures try to um, add to the representations are very similar to the kind of information uh, about the structure that these methods are trying to instill. So they're not exactly like orthogonal things, which is just like one plus one equals two. You kind of don't get um, much better uh, performance if you are GNN encoders. Okay, so those were the very early methods. Uh, and what's kind of the hot method today? So these days it's a lot about <laughs> um, contrastive learning. Um, so contrastive methods learn representations by pushing together similar objects and pulling apart representations of dissimilar objects, right? So we call them positive examples or negative examples respectively. And um, the basic secret sauce or the thing that differentiates different contrastive methods from each other is one, how exactly do they do the pushing or pulling of the representations? And two, how do you define what is a, what is a positive example and what is a negative example, right? So uh, taking an example from the image domain because that's much more intuitive, 
Yeah. Um, so let's say you want to say something like the representations of these two dogs should be very similar and they should both be different from the representation of this cat, right? Uh, but our aim in this work is to avoid this uh, second step of repelling or uh, contrasting dissimilar objects. But why, right? Like, if these methods work well, why is this a desired goal of ours to remove the second step? Okay. So um, we can explain that by looking at some of the drawbacks of these contrastive methods through a couple of case studies. Um, so first we look at deep graph Infomax or DGI, which was one of the first uh, contrastive methods for graphs in this space. Uh, and it's very um, inspired by deep Infomax, uh, the method for images. So the basic idea in this is to contrast against a negative graph, okay? So how does this proceed? You're given an input graph. From that, you construct a, a corrupted graph, which is basically a realistic, but semantically dissimilar graph to the input graph. Uh, then you have your encoder, which computes node embeddings for the input graph and this corrupted graph. And additionally, you also compute a global, <laughs> a global summary of your input graph. So this could be, let's say just the average of all the nodes in this um, graph. And you pull together each real node with a real global summary and push apart each fake node representation with a real global summary. Hope that makes sense. Um, and this is nice because it works quite well in practice, like the performance is good. Um, and it has some nice theoretical explanations like maximizing some uh, mutual information objectives. So, so what's really the problem with this? Well, the problem is I, I didn't really say how we compute this corrupted graph, right? So we want it to be both realistic and semantically dissimilar, which is pretty difficult. So um, the contrastive methods and images get around this by, okay, let's say you have ImageNet and your input is the image of a dog, right? You just pick a random image from all over the data set and you know with high likelihood that's probably not a dog or at least something very different. Uh, so you just say, that's my corrupted image, which is realistic and semantically dissimilar and uh, you just proceed and that's great. Um, but that works uh, fine for <coughs> images, but for graphs, many data sets actually consist of a single graph, right? So let's say we have Google Maps where their map is like the whole world or something. Um, and there is no other graph that you can actually sample randomly and say, ah, oh, this is something realistic but different. So uh, here the problem isn't of finding a negative example, it's of constructing a negative example. And this is a much more difficult uh, thing than just to, uh, yeah, just to say hard mine uh, out of a known set of uh, images. Cool. Um, after that, uh, there's this other method called Grace, which is very related to the Sinclair method for um, <coughs> images. This works by okay. You have this input graph, right? You construct two semantically similar views from it or augmentations. So this. And these two views should be semantically similar to the input, which is fine. This is a much easier problem than finding something semantically dissimilar. Uh, and this is contrastive learning at the node level. So we say that for each node, a positive example is the representation of the same node across the different view. And a negative example is every other pair, okay? And this is great because it solves two problems. One, you no longer need to construct a negative example you just need to um, get something realistic and semantically similar, which is easy. Maybe you just drop a few edges or something or just lightly perturb um, by adding some noise, right? Uh, and two, there's no um, arbitrary choice to make. Like, what is the negative example? It's everything. You're relieved of the pressure to make a choice. But of course, the problem is that this all versus all objective scales quadratically, right? So if you have a graph with n nodes, this takes n square memory and time to, um, to compute. And this clearly won't scale to larger graphs. Um, and in, in our work, we explored like, you know, how do we make this kind of practically achievable? So we tried like subsampling uniformly. So instead of taking all pairs, just randomly subsample uh, some pairs and apply the loss only to those. Um, this actually gives much worse performance uh, for a reasonable number of subsamples, you need like you need to sample many many negatives uh, before this starts to get good. Uh, and again, choosing smartly, so instead of 
subsampling uniformly, if you wanted to do some like, clever finding of negative examples, then we're kind of back in the same problem we had before, that we're required to make arbitrary choices. Okay, everyone with me so far? Cool. Okay, so <laughs> to- um, uh, what, what are the, can I, sorry, what do the failures look like in the embedding space or in the latent space? Do they just not separate um, or things uh, not? If we, if we do this, uh, mm -hmm. subsample uniformly, uh, the embeddings often collapse actually. Mm -hmm. So basically you're not pushing apart enough, if that makes sense. So the, um, yeah, the, the representations collapse to like a small number of modes uh, and that's usually not useful for whatever downstream task we have. Okay. Yeah. Because in these methods, it really is this um, second step of, you know, repelling the two things that prevents collapse, right? Otherwise you can compute the same representation for everything and yeah. Okay. Uh, um, yes. So yeah, uh, so to, um, yeah, the motivation was really to um, get rid of uh, negative examples to address these two problems. So we propose bootstrapped <laughs> graph latents or BGRL. Okay, so I'll go through kind of the mechanical description of what the algorithm looks like. So the key idea is to bootstrap embeddings from each node uh, without ever using negative examples, right? So let's say we're given a graph we generate two augmented views, uh, which is very similar to uh, how Grace does it. So this preserves semantic similarity. Uh, so here the augmentations play the role of defining transformations with respect to which we want our embeddings to be invariant. Okay, so intuitively like the representation of this and this should be similar to each other. Uh, we use two GNN encoders parameterized by theta and phi respectively. Theta is called the online encoder and phi is the target encoder. Um, and we'll see why that is. Uh, to compute these latents of the two views, H1 and H2. Uh, and the key idea is you train <laughs> H1 to be predictive of H2 rather than uh, directly pulling these two together. So we have an additional predictor, um, which is called P theta that from H1 output, uh, outputs Z1, which is supposed to be a prediction of H2. Uh, and yeah, we train this by making Z1 closer to H2 in the uh, cosine similarity. Uh, and we train this by this objective by only flowing the gradients through theta. That's why it's called online. Uh, and we completely block the gradients going through phi. Um, but so yeah, so how is phi trained, uh, why how is phi changing? So phi is basically a slow moving or exponentially moving average of theta. So this is kind of reminiscent of how a target network in DQN behaves, for example. So that's why we call these the target um, parameters. So um, if you've seen some related methods in uh, the image domain, you'll see that this is very uh, directly inspired from uh, BYOL or bootstrap your own latent. Um, and one of the changes we made is to actually get rid of this additional predict, uh, sorry, projector network that uh, BioL uses. Um, we basically saw that for the scale of commonly available graph data sets, which are much smaller than something like ImageNet, um, this actually didn't improve performance. And in fact, it actually uh, made learning much slower because you're now providing a much more indirect signal in some sense to the uh, basic uh, encoder because of adding those extra layers. Um, and you'll <coughs> also notice that some uh, trivial solutions do exist for this whole um, uh, training objective, like theta directly being equal to phi, because in that case, you know, uh, these would have the same uh, representations and um, yeah, things would clearly not make sense. Um, but in practice, we see that these are not obtained because the joint update to theta and phi isn't actually updating uh, any given loss. So theta is trying to maximize this cosine similarity, but phi is just um, yeah, uh, an average of the old parameters of theta. So because of this, in practice, we see that uh, things don't actually collapse and um, the representations learned are good, but yeah, a th complete theoretical understanding of this is still very much uh, under the works and yeah, it's very much an open problem to understand exactly what's happening uh, in these training dynamics. So yeah, just as a 
the recap, start with the input graph. You make a pair of augmented views. You embed one of them with the online encoder and one of them with the target encoder. From the online embedding, we try to predict the target embedding. And we basically use the cosine similarity to uh, train the online encoder. And phi is just a straight exponentially moving average of theta. Okay. May I ask a question here? Yes. yes. Um, so do you perform this um, augmentation on each single node in the graph? Uh, sorry, can you say that? Uh, do we perform the augmentation on, on, each, on each single uh, node? Yes, yeah. So the entire graph is actually updated. OK. Yeah. And I think uh, maybe the next slide is probably just okay. about, oh, okay. yeah, please. Sorry, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. OK. Um, yeah, so I think in this, the biggest kind of design choice um, that we have is the person who's using this algorithm uh, is the graph augmentations. And so far, we just know that these are perturbations that shouldn't change the semantics. Okay. Uh, and this is really the main mechanism to also add domain knowledge, right? So maybe you're working with some uh, I don't know, molecular data or biological data where you know a lot more about um, the properties of your graphs, and maybe you can design some more clever um, augmentations. So for images, this is kind of very intuitive. So the standard things people use is like flipping or cropping images or changing the colors a bit. And you know that eventually you're gonna use it for image and classification, let's say. And things like this typically don't change the class of the image. So you know you're kind of safe in applying these transformations. But for graphs, it's much less intuitive to human designers how we should uh, augment these uh, graphs. So, uh, and this might be related to your point C of we need to perturb the whole graph, right? So we're applying the augmentation to the entire graph as a whole, but we're concerned with learning embeddings for the nodes, right? So this is kind of like if you were augmenting an entire image, but you're learning representations for each pixel, right? So this is very different from augmenting an image and applying um, and learning a representation for the same image. Uh, and here the augmentations have to be um, in some sense coherently applied to all nodes in the graph at once, right? And that adds a bit of complexity in uh, when we try to design these augmentations. Um, so in practice, but like I think like 99% of the work I've seen is just doing some very cheap or simple augmentations, like randomly uh, dropping certain edges or randomly masking certain features of the nodes. So really this is the minimal amount of inductive bias I think that we're adding, which is basically saying, yeah, if you drop like 3% of edges, things shouldn't change much. Yeah. Uh, and even actually DGI, where they were trying to get um, a semantically dissimilar graph using this augmentation, I was also doing something simple like permuting all the nodes in the graph. Um, yeah, so this is definitely um, not perfect and it's uh, definitely an open area of research to get meaningful uh, augmentations for the graph story. No. Uh, yeah, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I, th I think for me, this is the most confusing part the, uh, okay. because at least in, I like to think of some concrete example of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I think permuting the graph ordering makes sense to me, but I, like if I'm taking the subway uh, or the, you know, I don't, I feel like as though if I don't end up in the right place, you know, by dropping an edge, I, I feel like as though that changes the meaning of the, of the subway map a lot. Um, do you have an right. example where dropping edges doesn't matter so much? So uh, I think like, okay. So um, in our work, we're using like the basic thing of just having a fixed probability per edge and dropping each of them independently. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some other works which, for example, uh, compute centrality scores and say, okay, maybe this edge is extremely important. And if you remove it, the graph certainly isn't connected anymore, right? And so you definitely don't want to remove that. So I guess in, in your subway example, that would be, I don't know, some line that connects to uh, very important uh, metro stations or something. Um, but, but conversely, it could be like, you know, in Google Maps, there are some roads that are connecting intersections that are pretty much already close together, it's fine to drop those with like a very small probability, if that makes sense. 
Um, and some of the other things that we're consider that we were considering are things like try to get some augmentations which say preserve connectedness at least. So try to get some random spanning trees and uh, just like take the graph and just choose a, ra uh, a random spanning tree of the graph and just use that, right? Um, a lot of these are also like theoretically nice but difficult to compute on a GPU. So also for like practical considerations, we just do something simple. Um, but I suspect, especially in um, things like chemistry or biology, some uh, domain knowledge could be very useful in how we design these augmentations. Yeah, I, yeah. I I think with edges, it's it it, it seems tricky because they're that's the power of graphs. You know that their edges are so power. You know, make such a big difference. The um, do you get more luck with the node feature masking because that that seems like more plausible. Like you could imagine that, you know, you could still, you could still make it home if you switched, you know, it from being subway to bus, or if you um, made right. it so that uh, if, um, in, in molecules, if you change it from a, a carbon to a silicon or, a, or an oxygen to a, an, another um, halide or something like that. That's a good question. Actually um, in our experiments, like in some of the ablations, we've seen that if you have only node masking, but no edge masking, it works much worse. Uh, but if you have, uh, you need at least some amount of edge masking uh, for it to really get a huge boost in performance compared to the baseline. And from that point on, uh, node masking makes like a slight difference, but not as uh, drastic as the edge masking does. Um, yeah, I think one reason is also that uh, we really want these two view, <laughs> views to also be different from each other, right? Because if they're too similar to each other, then again, the training um, dynamics are trivialized. So yeah, I think that could be a reason why like dropping edges really alters the computation of the neural network. Um, and that could be why these had a more drastic effect. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. So yeah. um, so in, in the two, in the online, um, network and the target network. Do you do this? Um, like, do you do a combination of both the edge uh, dropping as well as the node feature masking, or do you say, okay, one augmentation is going to be just edge um, dropping, but the other is going to be node feature masking? Yeah, uh, we do both in both. I see. Yeah, and this was actually important. Like, I, I did try like doing only one here and one here, and that didn't work super well. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, uh, great, yeah, so thanks for the questions. I really, really like the back and forth. Um, okay, so, okay, cool. So that's basically the um, method we were proposing. And the next obvious step is to compare it with some of the other methods. So we uh, focus specifically on node classification where GRACE is the current best method and the linear evaluation protocol. So this means that we use only unsupervised learning um, to train the uh, graph encoder till convergence, let's say, and then we freeze that encoder and train a task-specific linear model uh, on top without ever flowing gradients back to this, right? And we say that the better the performance of this linear model, the better quality the learned representations are. Uh, for the encoders, we mostly use GCNs, though we'll see um, our attempts to also uh, scale that up to attentional and message passing uh, networks. And uh, for the predictor P theta, we mostly used uh, only an MLP. So for the prediction phase, we uh, didn't take into account the graph structure. We, we do have some experiments where it helps slightly, um, but it's not clear whether that is worth the um, more parameters. Uh, and again, we're doing only simple augmentations where we're maxing, masking with fixed probability as opposed to using like the centrality scores or anything for uh, something a bit better. Uh, but in our um, experiments, we do compare with other methods that do use those, um, uh, they call them adaptive augmentations uh, and our method does perform better overall. Okay. Um, and trying to be fair to uh, the previous published work, we try to use the exact same architecture and the augmentation hyperparameters and so on. Uh, and where um, yeah, we're trying to report results relative to a randomly initialized GCN. 
So this means that uh, only the encoder is randomly initialized and you never train it and it's frozen. And on top of that, you train the linear uh, classifier to conversions, right? And this is actually a very strong baseline, surprisingly, um, because this actually encodes some really good inductive bias. And especially for uh, homophilus uh, graphs, where you know it's basically saying, if two nodes are close together in the graph, they have the same um, properties. And a lot of these data sets are homophilus, in which case these representations are actually really good. Uh, and in some cases, this is even better than pure supervised learning. So it's better to just randomly initialize your encoder than to flow gradients through it, which is weird. But um, it, it makes sense also in these data sets because uh, a very small fraction of the data is actually labeled. So if you're uh, flowing gradients through the encoder, then there's some overfitting happening to like the 10% of data that's labeled and it messes things up for the other 9%. Cool. And we're looking at <coughs> both uh, transductive data sets. Uh, and this means that <coughs> sorry, there's a single graph um, in the data set and all the nodes in it are known during training, right? So maybe uh, there are like 10,000 nodes, you have labels for a thousand of them. Okay, but you still have access to the connectivity information and the feature information for the other nodes. And this could um, maybe help for uh, representation learning. So in this, we have some citation networks where the task is to classify the paper topic and the uh, nodes are papers and their edges between papers that cite each other and some co-purchase graphs where um, yeah, the nodes are some uh, items on Amazon uh, and edges between things that are frequently purchased together and you want to classify the product type. Uh, and on the other end, we have inductive tasks, which means this data set consists of many graphs, right? You get to see some of them during training and you get to, uh, you're later tested on some others. So for example, you can't, um, yeah, you don't have access to like the structure or the features or anything uh, on the thing you're going to be tested on. Uh, and on this, we look at PPI, which is <laughs> a data set of some protein interactions, but the task is to predict some biological properties. I, I, that's the, the extent of the biological information I know. Is there a go ahead? Um, yeah, so, um, so in all your experiments, do you use uh, GCN as the encoder? Or do you also experiment on like uh, attention-based, like uh, graph attention network? Yeah. And so, so for most of these, we use only GCNs mm -hmm. um, because they are actually homophilous, but the PPI data set is the one where it's known that uh, attentional models work better. So we yeah. did actually try to extend um, the work to having uh, attentional encoders for this okay. data set. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And I, I can see okay. now with that data set that, that, that my concern about the links is actually seems to be much less because I would think for many papers, there's many authors. And so if you drop, you know, one, one citation, like you're probably kind of still end up in this right ballpark, you know, if you drop, drop a yeah. small percentage of them. So it seems more robust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's definitely true. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Um, okay. So we're going to start with some of the smaller data sets, which are between 10 to 30,000 nodes. Uh, and basically they're small enough where quadratic objective is uh, feasible to compute. So Grace is mostly able to be run on these easily. Uh, and we're always like zero is the performance of randomly initialized um, embeddings. Um, yeah. So we're comparing DGI, Grace and BGRL and fully supervised. So we see that most of the time Grace and BGRL <coughs> are um, both competitive with each other as well as supervised learning. Uh, so they perform quite well on all of these data sets. Uh, but we see that on the largest graph, which is the one with 30,000 nodes, uh, Grace is starting to see some of its limits because it runs out of memory on a uh, 16 GB um, GPU. Um, so it's interesting actually that not only does VGRL perform better in terms of like, the accuracy, the memory usage is also uh, much better because um, again, like uh, Grace is supposed to scale uh, as per O of M plus N square for the quadratic loss and BGRL is just O of M plus N, right? So uh, these data sets are arranged in increasing order of the number of nodes. Uh, and you see that while well, Grace, the memory kind of starts to blow up, BGRL uh, rises in a much more kind of controllable way. Uh, and this is actually really important in practice, uh, where especially for graphs, memory is really at a premium and um, yeah, you're often struggling trying to 
fit, uh, fit uh, everything in on the GPU. Uh, okay, so the next kind of question, natural question to ask is what happens if you scale up another order of magnitude where Grace has no hope of um, like satisfying the quadratic uh, objective. So we look at this uh, OGB archive data set, which has 170,000 nodes, right? And the <coughs> approximation we make to um, Grace is instead, because you can't fit all the pairs in memory, for each node, we subsample K negative nodes and only contrast uh, among those. And K equals two is kind of the um, asymptotic equivalent of BGRL in terms of memory consumption. Because BGRL has like the online and the target network. So that, that's why like, its memory is uh, double. So in red, we have the K equals two case. And uh, here in like light blue is BGRL. So we see that for equivalent uh, memory consumed, BGRL is much better. Uh, but slowly as you start sampling more and more negatives, and uh, when you reach like 2000 uh, negative sample, BGRL and Grace are very close to each other. So it's kind of hard to tell them apart if you have sufficient memory. Uh, but interestingly, they're also very close to supervised learning. Okay. So at this point we were thinking, okay, we're really trying to see if there's a difference in performance between BGRL and Grace. Uh, but for all of these methods, they were already very close to supervised learning. So in some sense, the data set performance is kind of saturated. So maybe it's hard to see the differences between these methods uh, at these scales. Uh, and kind of in pursuit of that, we were looking at the PPI data set, um, especially because this previously had the biggest gap between fully, self, uh, fully supervised and self-supervised uh, methods. So the previous SSL state of the art was around 0 0.66 and fully supervised <coughs> is around 0. Is about 0 0.96. So there was like a 30% gap. Uh, and we thought, okay, if the gap is so big, maybe we can actually, um, like there's more potential to uh, squeeze out performance with BGRL. So here in uh, different shades of blue, we see grace for different amounts of subsampling of the negatives, starting from 16, going all the way to uh, basically doing no subsampling. You use all uh, pairs. And in red is BGRL. Uh, so we see that actually BGRL is performing better. And in this data set, this difference is uh, pretty significant. Um, and yeah, again, we were using uh, graph attentional encoders here because it's known that at least for supervised learning, they were uh, doing much better than GCNs on this data set. Uh, and so far they hadn't been trained in a stable way using only self-supervised learning. Uh, so we can kind of try to diagnose this by looking at the uh, uh, the internals of these models. So here we're plotting the uh, attention, the entropy of the attention distribution in the um, uh, graph attentional layers. And to the right is kind of a smooth attention distribution. And all the way to the left is a very peaky attention distribution. So we see that uh, as your loss gets in some sense richer and richer, as you're doing less subsampling um, or you're sampling more nodes, uh, the attention distribution also becomes healthier and each node is actually paying attention to more of its neighbors uh, as opposed to just like a single one, let's say. Uh, and even in this case, BGRL does have the smoothest distribution. So this is at, at least correlates with the higher performance and it could be indicative of why um, these models are performing better. And uh, just as a final thing, um, one kind of, Kind of sanity check question at the end is okay does learning with bootstrapping really require tons of data like okay we in the large data regime we have like memory savings and stuff but is it the case that bootstrapping requires a lot of data in order to learn stably so to check this uh, we compared on four much smaller data sets with between two and twenty thousand nodes um, and basically bootstrapping works just fine we don't need any extra tricks and this actually gets state of the art on uh, two of the smallest data sets of, I think, 2,000 and 3,000 nodes. So that's pretty nice that this method is flexible enough to work out of the box with uh, many different um, scales of data set. Okay, are you with me? Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, yes, so um, uh, this was kind of great timing because just at the point where we were kind of wrapping up this uh, BGRL project, um, the group at Stanford, <laughs> sorry, uh, the group at Stanford uh, announced this Open Graph Benchmark Large Scale Challenge, um, which was meant to accelerate 
a really large scale neural network uh, research. Uh, and I really like this quote from their website, which is, we hope that OGB LSC will be the image of moment for graph learning, essentially. I think that was a very nice sentiment. Um, okay, so earlier when we were calling the our big data set as 170,000 nodes, now they're like 240 million nodes and like 1.7 billion edges. So this is like at a completely different scale. And uh, so this had like three tracks of which we were focused on the node level track, um, which did have the largest graph as well. So it was interesting to see how PGRL would scale um, yeah, to this much larger challenge. Okay. So just to set up the problem, uh, the data set is the Microsoft academic graph, which is a single connected graph. So we're again in the transductive learning setting um, where the nodes are like papers, authors, or institutions. The edges are between papers that cite each other, authors that write a paper, and authors being affiliated with an institution. And it's like 10,000 times larger than uh, the commonly used like academic data sets. Uh, and of these papers, 1% of them are archive papers. Uh, and the task is to classify these archive papers into one of like 153 different archive categories. Uh, right. And our main question and motivation is, does BGRL help at the super large scale? Because th this really was like an unprecedented uh, scale we were dealing with. Okay. And um, it's important to note that this is a big de <laughs> departure from our previous setup, right? Um, so for one thing, the graph is way too big to fit completely in memory, right? So earlier we had the entire graph on GPU and each training update step was like a gradient step on the entire graph. Uh, but now we have to train on subsampled neighborhoods. So maybe this makes the loss less uh, stable. Um, because the data set was more challenging, we were aiming to use uh, message passing networks, which are like the most powerful, but the least scalable uh, or easy to train of the three flavors we talked about. So it wasn't clear whether BGRL would work with those. Uh, only 1% of the nodes kind of made sense to classify because 1% of them are archive nodes. Uh, and one question was how do we effectively use the other data? Does it make sense to apply an unsupervised loss on sort of this different class of nodes that we are not interested in even uh, predicting the properties of? Uh, and because this was a very complex data set, um, we thought we might have to, <coughs> have to bring back the viral projector networks uh, to make learning more stable. Uh, and finally, the linear evaluation protocol is definitely too weak um, for a data set of this uh, difficulty. So we'd have to combine unsupervised learning with supervision. And in my opinion, this was definitely the biggest question mark. Um, and going into it, I was definitely like, not at all sure whether this would work or not. So we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, so bootstrapping methods in general, including BYOL, were not tested in this setting where you're combining unsupervised learning uh, with a supervised loss. And uh, the key concern is that the training dynamics aren't well understood. So let's say for GRACE or something, or DGI, they're maximizing like these mutual information objectives. You kind of have a theoretical backing of what's happening and you can scale these two losses and say something concrete about um, how combining these losses is gonna affect the representations. Uh, but here we have much less uh, of an understanding of what's happening. So one thing is, okay, like theta and phi are kind of in this delicate balance where theta is trying to predict phi, phi is copied from uh, old, <coughs> old versions of theta. Uh, and maybe this delicate balance between the two where they're chasing each other's tail is completely thrown off when theta is now pulled in another direction by um, a supervised loss, right? So this was one of the big uh, fears we had that this would destabilize the training. Uh, and for this, we tried many things initially. So or maybe you pre-train for many epochs uh, purely unsupervisedly to get a really good encoder and then you do pure supervised learning um, to fine tune that. Or maybe you like have both of the losses at the whole time, but you scale them um, to go from like pure unsupervised to pure supervised smoothly. Maybe we need to sample the um, inputs uh, basically differently for the supervised and unsupervised data and lots of different questions. 
but I ask um, a question kind of, about the task. Yes. Um, you know, you said that yeah. it's noted, you noted that like, um, you know, large numbers of the nodes are outside the archive uh, uh, network. Um, are those nodes, when you say that those are um, unlabeled, that means they don't have a classification. They're not, they're not an archive classification, but there's, are they still uniquely identified as being like a certain, at a certain institution or at a, um, uh, at, at a, um, you know, in a certain journal or that sort of thing, or are they just um, completely? So I think uh, th that's a good question. I think we don't have the uh, venue information of like where it was published, uh, but we do have um, uh, the BERT embedding of the paper's title and abstract. Okay. So th there is some information available about the papers, but not, um, but yeah, not uh, the venue. Um, it was actually interesting. Like one of these things we had to do was, so we have only the labels for the training nodes, right? But pa uh, papers often try to cite kind of the official version of the other papers and not the archive papers. So when you're like sampling these neighborhoods, you never actually got the other papers that were part of the training set. Um, so yeah, there were some kind of interesting data science -y things we had to do for this. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to report that just the simplest thing works the best out of all the things we tried. So just add the two losses together, that's it. Don't even scale things, no fancy like training schedules or anything like that. Um, and I think this is very interesting and kind of worthy of note um, because, okay, so now each batch just has a mix of labeled data for the supervised nodes and so supervised loss and unlabeled nodes for BGRL. And I, I think it's crazy that this worked just out of the box. Um, yeah, and that was something I was very excited by. And I think it makes it more likely to be applicable to many different scales of problems, many different domains. Uh, and it's just easier from a practitioner's uh, point of view. So this is definitely not obvious. Uh, okay, so when trying to implement this, uh, as a first step, we decided to add the unsupervised loss only um, on the label data. So basically we had these training archive nodes that have the supervised loss on them and this unsupervised loss and just add them together. So loss was not applied at the other 99% <coughs> of nodes, uh, but we were saying, okay, is it still useful to have these as an auxiliary signal, even if we're not adding unlabeled data, right? Uh, and it turns out it is. So in green, we have fully supervised. Uh, and we see BGRL and Grace are both improving uh, over that. Uh, and BGRL is performing uh, slightly better uh, at this point. Then the second step is, okay, we have this 99% data. Um, we probably wanna make use of that. So we, um, this is an experiment testing, mixing different amounts of unlabeled data uh, into the batch. So at, in blue, we have like not mixing any unlabeled data, then uh, like a, uh, one is to one ratio, then five is to one and 10 is to one. Uh, and we see that as you mix more and more unlabeled data, the unsupervised loss is more easily able to uh, make use of that data, get better uh, representations and uh, performance improves. Um, and we tried only until uh, a ratio of 10 because this was a competition and we were kind of on a deadline and the bigger uh, ratio you use, the longer you have to train. Um, but potentially the trend could have continued uh, up to like a ratio of 99, just to balance the labeled and unlabeled data. Uh, and I think that's quite exciting that this kind of is, uh, follows such an intuitive uh, trend. Does so, the unlabeled uh, data, data, sorry, does the unlabeled data stop the, is that overtraining um, that makes it so that the accuracy drops as you train exactly. overtraining? Okay. Exactly, precisely, yeah. So, um, Basically, yeah, uh, just as you said, that uh, mixing a ton of unlabeled data seems to delay overfitting, right? So with 10x data, let's say we just run for uh, 10 times longer. So we trained for like 500,000 learning steps and there wasn't any overfitting detector. Um, and at this point, both BGRL and Grace were like way better than um, fully supervised. Uh, and BGRL was slightly better than Grace. And because this was a competition, we just, went with whatever 0.1% we could get. Um, yeah, and at the end, finally, with some uh, more tricks like 
um, ensembling and better sampling strategies for the neighborhoods. Um, we were second uh, in the competition, uh, which was pretty nice. And I think what's really interesting is that uh, our model only had <coughs> uh, like 5.3 million parameters, which is orders of magnitude less than uh, what a lot of the other teams were doing. So I think um, other teams worked a lot on, I think, more expressive models uh, and better architectures. Uh, whereas we used um, just like the standard MPNN architecture, uh, but a better use of unsupervised uh, losses. So yeah, basically there is some orthogonal contributions being made by everyone. And I think this could all stack and that would be uh, interesting to test out. Okay, so basically um, to summarize, uh, what, what are our main takeaways? So we definitely know that BGRL in terms of performance is competitive with contrastive methods uh, without using any negatives, uh, which just means it's just much easier to implement in practice and you're less worried about, oh, am I having the right design choice? Am I sampling enough negatives, whatever. Uh, it works very well, even with these more expressive and hard to train encoders. Uh, in some cases, there are really big wins in memory and performance because of being linear as opposed to quadratic. And it's, I think, surprisingly practical and effective uh, even on really large scale and huge graphs. Uh, and some interesting future directions could be uh, learning graph level embeddings instead of node level for uh, using a completely different set of tasks. Um, and definitely <coughs> we need to research into stronger graph based augmentations um, because in the image domain, it was seen that better and better augmentations really do boost the performance of like a whole class of methods. Uh, and in graphs, we're really scratching the surface of what are meaningful augmentations to do. Uh, so I think this would be quite an exciting direction. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot. And yeah, if there are any questions, I'm happy to discuss. Thanks. Awesome. I think that was a very nice and, and clear talk that you've uh, given all of us. Um, so let's let's thank Shantanu with a bout of virtual applause. Um, so if if there are any questions, please do ask. I know it's a little late, um, Shantanu, for you, but if you have some time to stick around, um, we can ask your uh, ask our questions to you now. Yeah, I, I it's ten p.m. I'm basically free. So <laughs> okay, yeah. I had a quick question. Um, thank you, Shantanu, for the talk. That was actually really, really, really interesting to uh, listen to. Um, I just wanted to ask first about um, your uh, how you exactly did like the 10 to 1 um, at the end where you were mentioning um, just scaling up the amount of unlabeled data you were doing. Um, because you said you were um, simply adding the supervised loss and the unsupervised loss, right? So how did you like kind of put that together? Did you like basically like add all the tens unsupervised losses and then add it to that one or did you do something else um yeah do you mean for this yeah uh, this graph yeah yeah okay uh yeah so basically um in this one we were sampling let's say like 256 nodes or whatever the batch size is and applying the loss or the fully supervised loss and the bgrl loss to those 256 right uh and instead here we're doing something like uh, say 25 of those are things for which we know the label and like the rest are um, just sampled uniformly over the whole graph. So they could be maybe something you know the label for or just like uh, a, a different paper. It could be an archive paper, it could be a non-archive paper, anything. Uh, and we apply the BGRL loss only to those 90%. So not to this 10%. Um, and yeah, the supervised learning loss only to this 10% because these don't have labels. Uh, and yeah, at the end we just, we do average uh, the loss between uh, like the rel the relevant input. So like divide this loss by 25, this by oh, okay. 231 uh, and then add it. Yeah. But yeah. basically I guess the point I was making is um, like there's no fancy scaling of the two uh, basically because I think we were earlier doing things like, you know, start off as purely unsupervised and increase the fraction of unlabeled data and then do this and the, it just, yeah, that's really interesting that you can just add them and like without any sort of weight and it works so well. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I was very <laughs> surprised. Thanks. I, I learned a lot from this. I'm really curious, um, uh, could you explain or do you have a reference on the, the attention, was it attentional entropy um, graph that you had that looked just so intriguing? Yeah, um, okay, so 
Yeah, so this is, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if this is like a standard standard um, diagnostic that people use, but is this something I was playing around with? Uh, so here what I did is just, you know, um, once you've trained the encoder, you have uh, a distribution of attention, right? That each node pays to all of its neighbors. So you compute the entropy of that attention distribution for each node and subtract from it the entropy of the uniform distribution because basically each node has a different number of um, a different number of neighbors. So to fairly compare between a node with like five neighbors and 200 neighbors, uh, just yeah, uh, look at how far is it from a perfectly smooth distribution, a perfectly even distribution for entropy, uh, and then just plot the average of that. And the intuition is that the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to being completely uniform. So something like what GCN would do. So you don't want that, right? Because if you're completely uniform, then you're not really paying attention differently. But you also don't want to be, uh, you know, completely on the left where you're paying attention to a very small number of nodes. So I think like this, there's some like trade-off to be had here. Uh, and I do think it's cool that we see that really the more rich the loss is, the more well-behaved these attention distributions are. Because I think in most cases, you probably do want to pay attention to most of your neighbors. And it's probably very rare that you uh, want to just ignore a neighbor or something like that. Yeah, okay. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's very intriguing. I mean, I, I, I think one of the one of the things about all these networks is just making it so that we have more ways to understand how they're they're evolving and i, I think that is just is a very clever way of doing it Thanks. i um, think there was one paper sorry oh no no go ahead i was just going to ask another yeah, question uh, but yeah yeah just really quickly there was one paper that we saw the um which is basically making the statement that um you need more targeted losses for attention, these uh, attentional models to have um, more well-behaved uh, distributions. Um, without going into much detail, what targeted losses means, um, but maybe we can say, you know, like for this subsampling, like with this drastic amount of subsampling, it's really not targeted. It's just kind of going all over the graph. Whereas this is very targeted to the uh, image of the same node in the different graph. But th there's I don't think any theory to back this. This is very hand wavy. But yeah. no, no. I think it's. I think it's interesting. I'll. I'll, I'll talk to see you about it. But maybe it would be okay if we maybe emailed you um, about it later. I'd like to, might want yeah, to please. try it out on our own, our own networks. Yes, please. Um, I had a quick question. Um, I, I thought it was like pretty cool to see. Um, your method works really well on graphs of different scales, like starting from very small graphs to like extremely huge graphs. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of like what practical compute and how much training time does it take for training these um, kind of things. So if you have a comment on. Um... Um, right, so for basically everything other than the large scale challenge, we used a single V100 GPU. So that's around 16 gigs of memory. Mm -hmm. um, so that was basically it. Uh, and on this, we used a single TPU, which has a TPU V3, which has um, 16 GB of memory. Uh, and we used eight of those basically to parallelize training and make it faster. Uh, but in terms of training, uh, in terms of like actually being able to do something. There's no reason why you couldn't use a single GPU. Just, it would be eight times slower, that's it. So I, I, I think in terms of compute memory was um, really something we were trying to make not a blocker. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have the graph somewhere of, yeah. Uh, yeah, like the memory we took was yeah, like well within the limits um, on all these small data sets. Uh, and even on the largest, like the uh, OGB LSC, I think we were taking around nine GB of memory uh, on a core with 16 GB, so not terrible. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Awesome, so if, um, do I, any of you have more questions? I can ask one more. This is really interesting. So uh, going back to your, um initial explanation why like this works on positive just positive examples right and you don't need negative examples I, i'm still i'm still trying to wrap my head around a little bit how like this model doesn't collapse when 
just ju just positives are used and it avoids the trap that you mentioned earlier where they all kind of go through the same embedding. Um, could you just re hit on that real quick? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is probably the biggest um, question mark in this method of um, why it works um, really well. Um, okay, so let's say like there wasn't a stop gradient here and we were just flowing losses on both theta and phi, then I think it's totally um, intuitive why this would collapse because the joint update to theta and phi is minimizing this loss and there's kind of no other signal to that. So eventually that loss is gonna to go to zero and theta is gonna equal phi. Uh, or basically they're going to represent the same function, right? So if this stop gradient were not there, but because it is there, um, yeah, basically uh, there is a conjecture that there does not exist a loss function for which this particular joint update to theta and phi follows the gradient of that loss function. So that is a conjecture and we made some progress improving that, but it's, yeah, it's not proven yet. Um, <clears throat> But uh, at least that's the intuition we have that um, the joint update to this definitely isn't minimizing the cosine loss. And further, it probably isn't strictly minimizing any other metric as well. Um, and there is some work uh, very recently, uh, some theoretical work on proving why this does not collapse. However, it doesn't say anything about why this is useful. You know, like th there's a difference between just not collapsing and learning something useful. So <laughs> um, that second part is still open, uh, but yeah, under some assumptions, I think uh, there, there's some work on proving that it does not collapse. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Awesome. Okay, so I guess if there are no more questions, then yeah, thanks Shantanu again for um, your time and then yeah I, we'll have this talk uploaded on um, YouTube by the end of the day and we'll send you a link for that as well and I'm sure like people when they view it later they might have like questions or possible suggestions and so we'll put them in touch with you or um, there's also like place um, we, we have a form on our, on our website where people can add their questions so um, looks like there are a lot of interesting avenues for discussions as well so Awesome. Thank yeah, you. that sounds great. I'm uh, happy to receive tons of emails. Hopefully. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But thanks a lot. This was a great experience and um, yeah, really nice discussions. I learned something as well. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.